We're going to do sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the dunes to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Greetings and welcome to The Anadromist. This is Burn Power. And today I'm going to start talking about something that I've wanted to talk about uh, for a while now. There has been an interesting conversation, or three, that has been brewing on the internet for a while about the nature of symbolism. And um, part of this uh, relates to Jordan Peterson's discussions, uh, bringing in kind of union ideas about symbolism. Another part of this relates to uh, Jonathan Pajot and his orthodox perspective on symbolism. Um, and uh, these have provoked different kinds of thoughts in me. Um, so I thought I would kind of begin to unravel some of my thoughts about uh, the nature of symbolism as I've seen it. This is something I've been thinking about uh, probably since the early 80s, one way or another, maybe even a little bit before that. But in my uh, mid-20s, I started thinking about this. Before I get too far, let me remind you that uh, this channel does could use a few more subscribers. And if you feel like subscribing, hit that button now. Also, feel like liking it if you like this kind of content. And uh, if you wish to support this channel, uh, you can do so through PayPal. And I'll explain a little bit more at the end. There is a way to do that on a monthly or, or a one-time shot. But uh, anyway... Let's continue on. Let's call this layers of symbolism, because I think that there are different kinds of symbolism. And there's certainly a kind of symbolism I rarely hear anybody talk about. Um, actually, several types in this discussion of symbolism. So, let's see. Where shall we begin? One thing is that symbolic activity is human activity. Ernst Cassirer, a German philosopher, uh, believed that what distinguished man from animals was the use of the symbolic. He called it the animal symbolicum, or the symbolic animal. Here's a direct quote from Cassirer. Man, for many philosophers, both ancient and modern, is the, and he puts this in quotes, representational animal. Homo symbolicum, the creature whose distinctive character is the creation of the and manipulation of signs, things that stand for or take the place of something else. And what he's saying is that that's one way to understand what a human is. There have been many definitions of what it means to be human, but one thing we're pretty sure of is that to be human is to have a symbolic relationship with the world. And I don't just mean um, uh, in, in a kind of a cosmic sense at all. I mean, everything is a symbol. And I'll get to this in a moment. Suzanne Langer, in her Philosophy in a New Key, said about humanity, and I quote, We're constantly carrying on a process of symbolic transformation of the experiential data that comes to it. And it becomes a veritable fountain of more or less spontaneous ideas. So for her, um, symbolism or the symbolic was to be found in everything. Um, and and she, she recognized that there was a crisis in uh, when she was writing the 20th century, but certainly in the 21st century as well. She said nature as man has always known it, he knows no more, since he has learned to esteem signs above symbols, to suppress his emotional reactions in favor of practical ones, to make use of nature instead of holding so much of it sacred. He has altered the face, if not the heart, 
of reality. And this would go very well with some of the ideas that Hans Ruckmacher said, and in fact, Hans Ruckmacher quotes Suzanne Langer in his What is Reality uh, lecture. So what is the nature of the world around us? This is Ruckmacher's great question in What is Reality? Because he says, on one side, we have scientific definitions that water, for instance, is H2O. On the other side, we have our actual lived uh, experience of water. So, for instance, the fact that water is H2O tells us almost nothing. It, it tells us about water in that its properties. We know that at a certain temperature, water will freeze. At another temperature, water will turn to steam. We know that, like all matters, it has three uh, states, gaseous, solid, and liquid. Um, you know, so that, that these kind of things, if you look up, of course, water and in, let's say the Encyclopedia Britannica, you're going to find a lot of scientific diagrams and equations. Um, you're going to find out about the distribution patterns of water, um, uh, the, uh, the ecological patterns of water. Uh, you're going to see how water, you know, uh, works on the landscape and such. Of course, if you keep researching, you're going to find out that the human being is made up of a great quantity of water. And that water, you know, you'll learn all these scientific details. We never experience this stuff. This is all fairly abstract. Because for us, water isn't that. Uh, how do you explain the effect of water? Um, well, if you want to know its effect on you... The best way to feel the effect of water is to go out on a very hot day and do work outdoors in the sun and don't drink and then come home and get a cool glass of water. And that's going to give you an experience of water that no scientific textbook will ever be able to tell you about. Um, just as... You know, uh, the water in a swimming pool has a very different effect on us. The water in a little stream has a very different effect on us. Uh, I can walk up on the hill here in Georgia, and there's a, a freshwater stream of water that comes out this one uh, spring, and, and it's tasty water. Uh, I can also walk up to another place over here where there's a, a stream, and there's effluent coming from a village up the hill. That tells me something very different. The smell of that is pretty bad. And that goes into the river. So that tells me not to swim in the river. But that doesn't mean that exhausts what the river is in any degree. Um, you know, it's like if you've ever been walking along the beach as the sun sets, that means one thing to you. But then to see an animal like a shark fin in the water, that's something very different. Um, you know, water comes in the form of rain and the effects, uh, the, the way rain affects us is, is there's so many different ways it affects us. It doesn't affect us in one specific, you know, watery way. It, it, it can affect us like, um, you know, a sun, a, a shower with, that has sun, you know, a sun shower, the, the sun and shower clouds and, and rain mixed up together with the sunshine that affects us one way. Then a dark, dark black cloud in the sky with with sun uh, without sun affects us a totally different way as it's raining. Uh, the rain in Alaska, for instance, which is generally lighter from when it comes, uh, although it's more continual, will affect affect us one way and affect each person differently. So, uh, you know, what is water and Hans Ruckermacher ends his lecture on what is reality, discussing, as he says, this most fascinating of topics. Because even, is it what we experience, the, the many, many ways we experience water, whether in the form of ice or hail or snow or steam or rain or the ocean or a lake or a river, or is it H2O, the scientific thing? Is that the reality of water? I asked that question many, many years ago. I'm doing it again. What is water? Well, water is the beauty of the waterfall. It's the drink given to the thirsty. 
Christ even gives us an entrance to heaven for that. It is the bad smelling little canal that you have in Holland. It is the roaring seas. It is the rain in your face. It is the nice little water in the swimming pool. We can go on for hours what water is, and we can ask many, many poets, and they, can, they have written, and they will go on writing about this fascinating, most fascinating of all fascinating topics, water, one of the basic elements of creation. Or is it, and then we say it with modern science, H2O? That's the question. And Ruckmacher would say, well, this is what we are told in school. And by believing that, that that is water, that, that simple scientific definition, uh, we believe something that's not exactly real. It's what Owen Barfield would call an idol. It is a substitute for the reality. Interestingly enough, um, Galileo uh, developed the idea of primary and secondary qualities. So the primary qualities for Galileo were things like solidity, extension, motion, number, figures. And these are all things that he said were independent of the observer. That is to say, they're just there. And then there were secondary qualities. Uh, and he said this. I think that tastes, odors, colors, and so on are no more than mere names so far as the object in which we locate them are concerned and that they reside in consciousness. Hence, if the living creature were removed, all these qualities would be wiped away and annihilated. And he wrote this in his book in 1623, The, the Assayer, someone who is uh, assaying and weighing things. Uh, trying to figure out what they mean, what the what is the quality of things. So, now what's happened over time is that, you know, for instance, solidity. Now, you can meet people all over the place who say, well, nothing's really solid because it's all just matter and there's actually more space within the matter than there is matter. Uh, look at an atom, for instance. Or extension. Well, this is this, you know, extension, the thing that, that you know, uh, the, the second dimension, well, the third dimension, shall we say. Um, motion. Well, all of these things start to, and, and figure, I don't, you know, all those things in particular have all been questioned by physics and, uh, you know, more scientists have come along so that the only primary quality that is left in a really scientific understanding of the world, is number. And here's the funny thing about numbers. They don't exist. What do I mean? Well, they don't exist except as symbols. Uh, that is, you don't find anywhere in numbers, you know, there's certainly, there's no, uh, no writing around that says, you know, there, there's not a cat that has the number two on it because it's the second cat. Uh, there's no numbers just sitting there. Now, there are animals like that can count a bit, you know, but still, they don't do math. Numbers don't mean anything to them like they do to us. Um, through numbers, we understand the world, but numbers are just symbols. You know, and I think it's really ironic that... that uh, Galileo says, if the living creatures were, were be removed, all these qualities would be wiped out and annihilated. <laughs> That's pretty true for number as well. So in other words, does that mean nothing is real? No. It just means that the definition cannot simply be, well, it can't simply be those primary qualities in any degree. Um, and I get into this in, more in my discussion on what the nature of time is, because I think it is at this point where there is a mistake being made by the scientists, and I firmly believe it was a mistake, of taking that which we could weigh and measure and be taken in by the senses uh, to be of primary value over that which couldn't be weighed and measured. So, for instance, my words as I talk can't be weighed and measured. And guess what? My words are symbols too. So is all the alphabet. 
you know. In fact, everything in science is a symbol. Uh, music is a symbol. Money is a symbol. Everything is a symbol. So that we don't do anything without using symbols. Uh, if someone wants to make, uh, you know, say, well, you know, burn what you're saying is crazy. The only way you can argue with me is by being symbolic. That is to say, you know, and if you really want to be <laughs> argue, you, what you'll do is you'll get a poster or a, or a flag of some sort and you'll march around and you'll protest and you'll say, you know, burn's insane. There is solid things and you have to use symbols to do that. So everything that humanity does is symbolic. Uh, you know, what is, what do I mean? My, my language is symbolic. Um, well, you know, I apply a word, uh, screen to the thing you're looking at. Now, of course, there are different words in different cultures, although the word screen shows up quite a bit in different cultures or some variation. But it is the word screen, for instance, didn't originate from uh, my... Uh, it's not my word. I borrowed it from someone else. They took the concept from another. I haven't looked up the, where the word screen comes from. But they took that from another concept, you know, so that we're always making metaphors... And then we turn, and the metaphors eventually become uh, symbols for us, or which comes first. The metaphor is this is that, and um, the simile is this is like that, and it all breaks down eventually because it's, there are so many degrees of the symbolic. Um, so in this new conversation about symbolism that's taking place, I notice that people. Well, one thing they're doing is there. There is another thing out here, and it's the sign. Um, let me talk about signs versus symbols for a minute. The sign you could say is a prosaic symbol, and the symbol is really poetic. And so the sign. Well, if you see a sign that says "No smoking," well, that's a that has. There's no ambiguity about what that means. It means you, with your cigarette or cigar or pipe or or uh, marijuana, cannot smoke here. You, period. That's what the sign means. There's no, you know, unless it's a badly written sign, that's what a sign is there to convey. Uh, a sign gives you um, the most prosaic uh, version of something. Uh, there's that great... Uh, uh, moment in the film uh, Five Easy Pieces where uh, this waitress gets really peeved over Jack Nicholson's just wanting them to make a simple substitution on the menu and she she points to a sign and says, you see that sign? You see that sign, sir? And the sign says something like, we reserve the right to refuse anybody. And then he says, do you see this sign? Do you see this sign? <laughs> And, and as you see, his sign is a lot less ambiguous and a lot more symbolic, uh, uh, ironically. Uh, so much so that that, that particular uh, moment in the film was used, particularly in the 70s, as, as a, a moment, uh, we could call it an early meme, that people uh, use that as a, you know, this is what I feel about what you're saying kind of moment. Uh, but interestingly enough, propaganda is always a sign. That is to say, propaganda will take the symbol and push it on you. It, it, it's um, So whether it's the swastika or the hammer and sickle or the American flag or the Union Jack, you know, uh, whether it's the, you know, the crescent moon or the cross, all of these are symbols. And interestingly enough, in this sense, the symbol of those things represents something more than itself. But propaganda takes the symbol and strips it down to its least ambiguous meaning and basically pushes you in a certain direction. It's interesting that I, I see among people discussing uh, symbols, uh, they'll start talking about memes as symbols. You know, and by memes, I don't mean Richard Dawkins 
definition of a meme. I mean the little jokey uh, images that have like some text on them. So you take a an image of, you know, you could have taken the Jack Nicholson piece uh, as a GIF and have him just see this sign, see this sign, see this sign. And uh, that could be, and then, and you could write on that, see this sign. And, uh, you know, and then people use that, uh, you know, in response on some social media platform to say, uh, you know, I dislike this. Um, which gets rid of the heart of a lot of what that film was really about. But the point is this, the meme isn't really a symbol. It's a sign. And it's a, it's a joke too. Uh, and people seem to forget that what comedy is about is about shredding signs and myths and symbols. So that, for instance, if you take uh, an image of Jesus and put words above and below, it really doesn't matter what those words are. What you've done is reduced what was a deep image into a propaganda image. And that's dangerous. So that there, I can't see any memes of Jesus being anything other than some form of propaganda. I can't see, and memes in general seem to be always propaganda. Now, a lot of people might say, well, yeah, but there's a lot of symbolic resonance in the fact that we put the image of Jesus on there. Well, what you've done is you've reduced it from a symbol, which I'll define more in a minute, to a sign. The symbol is not something that's as hard it's not as it's not a hard definition of what it is the nature of symbolism is that it is not simply um uh this equals that i mean it can be and that can be a symbol and we'll discuss allegory in just a second here but you know just because a meme is funny doesn't make it symbolic. Both comedy and propaganda work on different levels, and they tend to be the kind of things that destroy the meaning of the symbol. Just as modern science has destroyed the symbolic nature for most people of the reality they live in. So let's talk about symbolism a little more. Um, there is a very influential book by Juan Eduardo Serlot, out of Spain, and it's a dictionary of symbols. Now, there are a lot of dictionaries of symbols out there. Some of them are just fluff and crap. I mean, if you open up a book and all it does is show you just images, it's not going to tell you anything about the images. In other words, it's just trying to sell... There's coffee table books on symbols. Uh, the thing about Sir Lot's book is... There are graphic symbols and images in the book, but that's not the point. The point is him discussing the meaning of the symbols. But at the very beginning of that book, and it's a book I originally found in the early 80s uh, that I have perused many, many, many times. I don't agree with everything he says, and I don't agree with his uh, interpretations. But what's nice about him is he's very fair. That is to say, he will say, you know, there are... Uh, uh, hermetic interpretations, there are esoteric interpretations, there are Jungian interpretations, there are Christian uh, interpretations, Kabbalistic interpretations, Muslim interpretations, uh, Jewish interpretations, you know, uh, artistic interpretations, uh, Chinese interpretations, Hindu interpretations, and on and on and on. And he's uh, very Catholic in the small c sense of the word of including uh, the meaning of images in many places. Now, what's interesting is if you compare what he wrote in that book, say, about colors, to, say, any YouTube video you find on the symbolism of colors, it's the difference between, I mean, what the, what the YouTuber is often going to do uh, is, is like finger painting compared to what Sir Lot is doing is like real painting. Uh, Sir Lot is more like uh, Rembrandt with his his description of symbols, whereas you know so much of this and you know orange is a happy color kind of thing. You know you know we see red and we feel blood and passion. Well, this is just like someone just going ooh gooey gooey. Uh, it isn't it isn't the real stuff. It isn't what the symbol actually is about. 
And, and he has a really great, uh, I think it's about a 50 page, uh, introduction, which I highly recommend where he talks about symbols. And one of the thing about symbols is there are different kinds of symbols. One thing that a lot of people get confused is the difference between the allegory and the symbol. The allegory is an image or a story that, or an image that tells a story that is very direct. This equals that. So, for instance, uh, and one obvious one is uh, in the Chronicles of Narnia, Aslan equals Jesus. Now, it's what's great about that book is it's not that simple, uh, because Aslan is also a lion. That is to say, C.S. Lewis understood that the lion has a symbol all of its own that has nothing to do uh, with Jesus specifically. But uh, many people uh, read the book in the most simplistic way possible, Aslan equals Jesus, and that way they don't ask other questions about the nature of the images in the book. Um, and that's kind of allegorical. Actually, Tolkien, who didn't like allegory, but was highly symbolic in his Lord of the Rings uh, works, um, uh, was critical of Lewis for making such an obvious allegory. But Lewis really liked allegory. In fact, he has a book, The Allegory of Love, where he studied medieval allegory uh, probably as deeply as anyone I know ever has. And, um, you know, looked at the way, for instance, love poetry worked in the Middle Ages, things like this. And, uh, interestingly enough, in the communist era, one of the best ways to communicate uh, was through allegory. And what I mean is the, both in movies and in theater, you see every work was put through a censor in the communist era in all the Eastern European countries. So what they would do is before they did a, a theater piece or before they did a, a movie, they would hand over the script to the censors who would go through it and look for anything uh, like this is too religious. This is too, you know, this is politically incorrect here. Um, for instance, this, the Soviets hated love poetry that was about me being loved. They wanted it to be the love of the people, uh, particularly during the height of their their repressive phase. They later loosened up a little bit and let people express themselves. But it was always always supposed to be about the collective. So anything that went against that was a problem. Well, what's interesting is, in my studies in puppetry, one thing I found is that uh, the puppeteers were actually highly revered for their ability to twist the, uh, the, uh, the actual plays they were giving to the, uh, uh, to the censors. So while I was in Poland, I spoke to, uh, the director of the, of the, uh, Teatro Grotesca in, uh, Krakow. And, uh, and we talked about, uh, how they would smuggle ideas through the censors. And, you know, at one point I said, so is this what happened? Did you hand them the, the, uh, the, the script, the play, and then they would go through it, and then you would change the images that went with it. And, they, and this one uh, really wry uh, director of uh, the theater said to me, yeah, <laughs> just like, you know, that's how you, you get things through. Well, so they used, um, they used allegory as a way to smuggle messages, and they developed it to a very high degree. Uh, another uh, theater director in the Czech Republic, uh, Josef Krofta, told me that they had he was developing a very interesting style of theater where uh, you had actually, instead of the puppeteers being hidden, you had actually the actors on stage with the puppets, so you'd see them both. And so they did this one play called uh, The Dragon by Evgeny Schwartz. Now, what this play was about was it was about a dragon that wants uh, to be given gold and and people um, sacrifices from this small village. And what's interesting is when they did it, he said, what we did was we made the the village to be actual puppets, but the dragon was played by an actor. So he was huge. So it was little puppets versus a dragon. Everyone in the audience 
saw something in that. And what they saw is that the dragon was actually the communist repression. And they were being, particularly in the, the uh, Czech Republic, they were the village. And of course, the dragon was also the Soviet Union. So, you know, that was one way. There's another uh, similar kind of thing. There's a really great uh, movie. I'll show you a clip here uh, from uh, Georgia by uh, director Tengiz Abuladze. And it's called The Wishing Tree. In it, you could call it a, a discourse on the nature of beauty and how human beings always tarnish beauty. But there are many layers to this allegory. And that's one of the things that uh, that uh, makes this film more than simply an allegory and, and puts it into the symbolic realm. But on the allegorical level, there is uh, a beautiful woman who is the daughter of a man uh, he's kind of hidden her away in a village. He's bringing her back into a larger village. And um, she gets picked up by a man who kind of has, uh, is basically a Russian. And then what happens is he suspects her of uh, kind of falling in love with another man. And he accuses her of adultery, which in the film she doesn't seem to commit. And But then what happens is the entire village, kind of like in uh, Shirley Jackson's The Lottery, they all kill this woman by throwing stones and mud at her and stuff like this. And in the middle of the stoning scene, there is a man who cries out the name Tamar. Now, if you're a Russian, this name means nothing to you except it's a woman's name. But if you're a Georgian, this name means everything because this is the name of the most revered uh, ruler of the Georgians, Queen Tamar, back in the Middle Ages. And so, by calling her Tamar in that moment, he is pointing to the fact that she represents the entire country. So suddenly you can reinterpret the entire film as meaning the woman represents Georgia. And the uh, the Russian, well, we know what he represents, and and the fact that you know you can just start to see this this deep layered allegory in it. So allegory can be an extremely deep thing. However, allegory is only one type, a very thin type of symbolism. So as we've seen, there is the symbolism of just daily life. That is to say, we can't do anything without symbolism. So you have the symbolism of numbers, the symbolism of language, the symbolism of money. Money is nothing if not a symbol. It's a symbol for your transactions. 
you know, uh, everything is done through a symbolic sort of, of uh, transaction. So even saying hello and goodbye, it's all symbolism. You know, and if you get the symbolism wrong, uh, I was just uh, watching someone's YouTube video about the difference between the way Americans say hello and goodbye and the way Germans say hello and goodbye. And uh, Americans tend to be pretty bad at goodbye. That is to say, we tend to, like on the phone, we're just like, well, it's been a great time to you. Goodbye. And we're just like, bleh. We're just done with it. Uh, we're also bad. I mean, in Alaska, where I live, people were, I would consider it some of the most horrifyingly bad examples of saying goodbye because people always wanted to think like, we'll see you again. You'll come back soon. So they were afraid to show this emotion that comes, uh, from, you know, a real farewell, but even, but Germans, even in their daily life will say, well, I'll, we'll meet each other again. When, you know, they, they will let each other know. It's all a symbolic transaction. And the symbols between one culture and another are very different. In a way, I prefer the, the, the kind of, the real, uh, deeper level f farewells that I've found in Europe to the quick, shallow, almost embarrassed farewells that my fellow Americans often, not always, but often will make. And, uh, so, yeah, symbolism, it affects everything. So, but real symbolism, and if I'm following Sir Lot here, which I am, symbolism is, uh, there's kind of an inherent symbolism, and I'm going to talk about this more in a minute, of textures, colors, shapes. Um, symbolism always has to represent something else, but what that other thing is, that's where the complexity comes. In allegory, it's very definite. In metaphor, it's, you know, Juliet is the sun. You know, that, that is in Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. It's not that, it's not Juliet is like the sun, but he has cut that out the like and said Juliet is the sun. Now we, the reader or the listener or the watcher of the play, no, Juliet is not the sun. The sun's up in the sky. Juliet is here. But in some way, they share a quality of, shall we say, radiance and warmth. And so that is a way of, so, but does that mean that it's only a metaphor? It's only a symbol? That's one of the problems we have in our, our times. If we go through school and we're taught in this kind of dry way about the nature of everything, which we are, so that, uh, you know, there was that song back in the 90s, that, you know, we're all just mammals, baby. You know, it's just like, if if we're just... If animals are just this thing, if everything is only this thing, if it's if it's all boiled down to matter, and that's all that it really is, then all this symbolic talk, talk it seems to be like waves on the ocean, a lot of foam, you know, it's it's nothing real. Whereas in fact, I would say it's the other way around. That's the deeper level of things, the symbols. And we are often existing in the foam. And part of our foam is the propaganda milieu that we are just drenched in. That turns, I mean, specifically, I mean, as an American, I have seen in my uh, 64 years of living this scraping off of the meanings more and more and more. So that all there is is to talk about are things which are either <clears throat> prosaic and meaningless things that go on, say, in the office or work, or are the kind of things that are, what should I call them? They're just ironic. You know, it's it's amazing how much uh, the American speech has become interlarded with references to media creations. So that, you know, in fact, let me uh, play you a moment of a guy. I like his his YouTube channel. His name is Arturo. He does this channel called Let Me Explain. But let me just play you a moment of his dialogue because it's fascinating how many media references he can get in in just a couple of sentences. Homie plays real life Red Dead into town but forgets it's the DLC, causing him to pull a Sierra Burgess under a tank when luckily Glenn from The Walking Dead saves him and they end up on a rooftop. 
Now, this is the kind of language that people in America speak. It is not the kind of language that anybody in Georgia speaks whatsoever. You don't have these people here uh, who, who are constantly making these references to media productions. But even that is kind of a dead giveaway. They're using the media in... It is symbolic. Uh, they, you can't escape the symbolic. Even though it's highly ironic, the ironic cuts out the meaning of the symbolic. It, it uh, digs in and says, after all, it's only just this. You know, it's not water. It's only just H2O. It's not a dog in the, in the full sense of the word. It's just, they're just dogs. It's that just only kind of feeling. And that's what the irony has a tendency to do, too. But I think we're also at a point where we have cut so much of the symbolic reality off of the world we walk through that the only place we can find it now is in our media, which is really, really, really a problem for us. And that's part of the reason why we have such problems with pollution. It was because the world we're walking through doesn't matter. But the world of our imagination, well, here's the problem. It's not our imagination. It's their imagination imprinted on us. It's another big problem. And we're not going to get into that right now. But the point is this. I think everything has a kind of inherent symbolism. Um, I did a whole lecture, which I'll reference right here, on texture. My whole point of that is that texture has an effect on us. The effect is not a prosaic effect, but it is a real effect. That is to say, you can't live in a room that, say, had the texture of a white refrigerator. Why not? I mean, you can, and there's nothing stopping you. There are people, I suppose, who have been in, in rooms of just kind of enamely white walls. But there's something deadening about it. It gets you. And in fact, it's amazing how many new houses in the West have been made that just have these white walls on the inside. Well, what can you do with those white walls? Put a screen in, because the last thing you want to do is spend any time looking at the white walls or even feeling those white walls. People often say, I need the white walls for space, to which I'm going like, yeah, you're killing the space because you're not letting it breathe with actual texture. Texture is part of the space. So there's kind of an inherent symbolism of colors and shapes uh, of all these things. I'm not platonic. I don't believe in, for instance, the perfect cup or the perfect chair or the perfect person, except as far as maybe that was Christ. But I don't believe in, in these platonic ideals. Rather, I do believe that, however, that there are cups that have, each thing has its meaning. And its meaning is its meaning. So, you know, there are cups which move towards being glasses. You know, like this one right here. Is that a cup or a glass? You know, well, uh, it's kind of a cup. You know, it's a muggy, glassy thing. But I'm not comparing this to any, like, divine creation up in the sky or, or you know, thing inside the imagination. But it is fairly, it, it is fairly well made, much better well made than a McDonald's cup, you know, or any sort of cup that comes from, you know, a plastic Slurpee cup, uh, a... A, you know, all these things that are made to just be thrown away. One of the problems is, you know, people are oh, now talking about uh, single-use plastic. And I think that's a, a good idea. It's a shame we didn't think about how meaningless these things were so long ago. In other words, we created the meaningless thing first. It, it is the fact that we live in a world that is emptied of meaning. And that's symbolic meaning. So that the, the cup that you throw away from a fast food vendor is meaningless. It is simply a cup that is, a, is there to hold water for a few seconds or hold liquid for a few seconds and then be disposed of. And by creating such things, we demonstrate the effect of it's only just a cup mentality. Um, but I think it's... It's not that this equals that when it comes to texture, color, shapes, uh, things, animals, countries, but that this is. 
It's not that it represents another thing. It's that it is and provokes thoughts. So, you know, it's one thing to be in a room. And I, this is one of the reasons why I like going to Switzerland uh, uh, to the Labrie Institute. Is there's a lot of rooms there that just have wood on the walls. And coming from America, where there's a lot less of these places, it's, it's to me, a breath of textural fresh air. And that wood inspires the symbols. That is say, it is symbolic. For instance, the wood makes you feel cozier. Um, but it is also inspires more thought. You know, I can go back to those rooms very easily. Whereas if I go back to, say, I, right now I'm thinking about a room I lived in in California. Yeah, I can kind of put myself in there. I don't quite remember the sh color of the shag rug. Uh, I don't quite, all I remember is bad white walls, uh, bad, uh, you know, the, the kind of ceiling where they sprayed fake texture on it. That stuff is hideous because it's, it's fake texture. It's not real texture. And you can tell the, the human knows the difference between the fake and the real. If someone hands you a bone and says, this is a real dinosaur bone, you're going to have a very different feeling than if someone hands you a really great simulacra of that bone made out of plaster. Why do you, why does it matter? Uh, Stephen Jay Gould spent a whole uh, essay discussing why does authenticity matter to us, knowing the difference between it being the real thing and it being an imitation. And it does, because there's something inside of us that wants to be in touch with the unique mystery that is inside of everything. So, which then brings the question, is there a unique mystery inside, you know, uh, McDonald's cup? inside a, you know, a Burger King cup. No, because what's happened is the symbol has been turned into a sign. And it has been done so with in two ways. One, the material is super cheap. Two, the, uh, the, 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 they have put something on it, which is a symbol sign thing called the logo. And the logo is there primarily for commercial propagandistic purposes. You see that logo, you see, you know, if I say an apple with a bite out of it, you know what you're looking at. If, if I say, uh, you know, uh, it used to be, you could say the peacock spread its wings and that was, you know, that was the NBC logo. I, I think it still might be on some level. Um, but you know, nowadays you see a rainbow flag. It no longer means the rainbow. You see what I'm saying? This is when the deep symbolic nature of the thing is co-opted and becomes a sign. It just means this now. And this is this. It is not something with deep mystery and significance, but it is something with a message. Uh, the message like uh, no swimming. You know, it's an unambiguous message. Although I would say the logo is a little more ambiguous. So we live in a world where we've been given a certain perspective. And the perspective is like this. If you go to a good encyclopedia and you look up something like crow or raven, you know, it's the genus Corvus in the family of Corvidae. And it'll, you know, that's what it's first going to tell you. And these Latin names just make it completely mysterious to you. <clears throat> but not mysterious in the sense of that you understand anything. It's just, oh, it's a corvid. Well, what's that mean? You see, most people don't know what those Latin words mean. Um, and then you see there's like 45 members of the family of crows, ravens, rooks. They're all kind of put together. How you distinguish them is a matter of some interpretation. In Alaska, we used to say, if you look at the ravens, uh, they've got one less pinion feather than the uh, crows, and that's how you tell them apart. So it's a matter of opinion. <laughs> Sorry, that's just a joke. Here's the thing, is that, you know, you can find out things like uh, that they probably evolved out of Asia, that they're among the most intelligent of all birds, maybe as intelligent as uh, the apes. That's how intelligent uh, crows, particularly large, large brained ravens are. And uh, in Alaska, I would meet crows and ravens all the time. I was always impressed by them. Um, 
And they would talk out, they would mention the fact that these birds show up in different cultures, mythologies, you know. And of course, everyone knows the raven by Edgar Allan Poe. They show up in art. Uh, there's the famous painting of uh, Vincent van Gogh with the field of wheat and crows flying, kind of a really intense painting. What the encyclopedias do not tell you is what happens when people look at crows or what happens when a crow looks back at you. And that's the living experience. I find crows fascinating and I've watched them for a long time. And I've, you know, for instance, here's a story that no one's going to tell you about in an encyclopedia. It goes like this. A friend of mine was working uh, in the forest. I can't remember exactly what they were doing, but they were working there. And over a couple of days, hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of crows kind of lined two sides of this ravine. And then they went to war with each other. And they fought and killed each other. And they almost all died. And then there were hundreds, maybe thousands of corpses of crows lying in the ravine. And then over time, the predator and scavenger animals came through and cleaned them all out. And then it was completely empty. You see... We want to say, we want to look for either a naturalistic explanation. Crows sometimes do these behaviors. Or we would be tempted to make it a symbolic, uh, allegorical kind of battle in our mind. But what's going on there is much deeper than that. And that's what I want to get to, is the depth of, it's like the next layer down. Like, well, let's talk about this for a minute. Um, but we'll come back to crows in a minute. And one thing I want to point out is that crows are black. And this is an important aspect of their character. But before I do that, let me talk about symbols. Maybe, oh, let me talk about union symbols for a minute. And let me talk about symbols as interpreted more traditionally. So Carl Gustav Jung, the great Swiss psychiatrist, um, came up with the idea of the collective unconscious. And he almost said it was like a well from which we which our images spring from. And uh, in a sense, now he uses the word God quite often, but I don't think... He's referring to something like the Jewish or Christian God. I think he's talking about something a little bit more, shall we say, pantheistic. That is say, everything being God. And we're dipping into this thing. Now, it's different than Eastern thought. And yet, there is a way in which... So, for instance, now, I believe there is a validity to the kind of symbols he talks about. I don't believe, for instance, uh, one of his disciples, uh, Joseph Campbell, talks about the hero of a thousand faces. So he says all stories are alike. I don't actually believe that. Uh, because I, I think, for instance, if you look at each individual's life, they don't conform to these stories. And yet you can make a story out of any individual's life. Um they don't follow these neat patterns. And, it's, and he gets his ideas from Jung that way, where he's, Jung has this thing where, you know, it's just like uh, the mandala image, you know, and you're supposed to, there's this thing everywhere in wheels, to which I'm going like, yeah, and so, and this doesn't mean much to me. You know, there's a, when I see mandalas, I just go like, oh, there's somebody's art that's in the form of a circle. It doesn't have any particular meaning to me. I like circles. There's not, nothing wrong with them. I like artistic images in circles. Uh, the great puppeteer uh, Richard Teschner uh, did his, his puppet shows in these circular forms. That's interesting. But 
But uh, a part of it is because I don't subscribe to the belief system that would make the mandala image all that interesting to me because it's too impersonal for me. Now, that's another whole issue is that there are only a few kinds of ways of looking at the world, that, that there is someone there, like God, or some kind of personality in the universe, that there's no one there, there's no God, this is all kind of a fluke, there's something there, energy force, and then other people just don't worry about it. Well, Jung, I think, is much more in the something there, that his collective unconsciousness is a thing. Hence, he tends to take certain kinds of images and blow them up to degrees I don't think they, they warrant. Um, so, at the same time, he rightly points out how much of everything is symbolic. My problem comes that he doesn't see... I don't think he sees quite the personal nature of each thing. He's a little bit more platonic than I would be. And I think I would lean a little bit more towards Aristotle, where the individual things have have importance. But here's my point, is that the individual things all have meaning. It's not that my cup goes back to some symbolic cup in the center of the universe. It's that all cups have meaning as containers. That uh, they hold things. So this is a pretty good cup for holding liquid. But, for instance, here's something I can do with this cup that I can't do with say, a styrofoam cup. I can hold gasoline in this. And as I learned once when I was younger, um, you know, if you take, uh, if, if you want to transfer gasoline into a car, never ever use a styrofoam cup because it will eat it away. And I, and I tried this once to pour it in and the cup just disintegrated. Now, we don't use styrofoam as much for cups these days as we used to, although some people still do. But the point is, is that that actually, though, puts a different image in my head of styrofoam. Styrofoam ends up being this very strange material. See, here's the thing. We often, you one of my big problems with um, symbol dictionaries, even Sir Lot's to a certain degree, is that they'll often talk about, you know, the say the crucifix the circle the square or they'll talk about you know the raven or uh the 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 color blue or you know all these things that have been around forever but what about the train the car you know the telephone pole the uh what about the computer the camera you know uh you know the the pill can the pill bottle all these things that are newer devices you know, what about the, the smartphone? That already contains a whole bunch of new symbolism attached to it. So this is one of the things I think is really fascinating. The way I look at it is that everything has an inherent meaning. That meaning is symbolic. So that when something new arrives on the stage, like a smartphone or, or in the past, a car, these start to take on. What it is, is it's like that styrofoam cup. For me, a styrofoam cup prior to that moment with the gas, trying to move gas with it, was a, uh, uh, was basically a, uh, it was a place to keep coffee warm, or, you know, liquids warm or cold, if you wanted that, or, or it was a cheap, disposable cup. After that, I started to see not only uh, styrofoam cups, but all styrofoam as this very strange thing. It started to accrue symbolic content to it. And that's what I'm trying to get to here. So there are layers. There are layers that go like this. For instance, uh, I can see... Okay, let's start. Okay, there's that, that layer of how we interpret everything. We're already in the midst of symbolism there. So whether it's numbers or alphabet or language. This is why I think, you know, this whole thing about language being symbolic is one of the reasons why I think the postmodern uh, dilemma of seeing the symbolic nature of language, but then saying, well, therefore, we cannot understand reality through it, is to which is my like, well, what else have you got? 
you know? <laughs> you know, you can't throw it out as being unreliable. Look how much it's done for us. I mean, you know, we're able to scritch some numbers on a pad, build a machine, and send ourselves to the moon. That's pretty darn precise. The fact that we can't also understand ourselves has more to do with the nature of humanity than it does with the precision of language. So I'm not going into the, you know, the William Burroughs kind of language is a disease kind of category. Um, uh, but here's, here's the interesting thing. So we start off with this, where everything essentially is symbolic on this very practical level. But then you move into things like allegories and then symbols, symbols in both the union and in, say, the esoteric sense. For instance, I can easily see the connections between a crucifix uh, where you have Christ hanging between earth, and, uh, sorry, hanging between the sky and earth, heaven and earth as a symbol. And, and, and just the way that looks, it feels like something. But now if I, put away my Christian brain for a second and now look at it as a uh, scarecrow. Scarecrow does the same thing. Scarecrow is a very fascinating image. But now I can look at that image as the, the kind of strangely shaped figure. And it is through thinking thoughts like this that I eventually arrived at puppetry. But by doing so, I also became interested in masks I became interested in the bandaged face. Now, all of this, you see, it starts as a crucifix, goes to a scarecrow, goes to, say, the mummy or the Phantom of the Opera, and, and I'm side-slipping, as you see, different categories here. You have the Christian category, then you have the, um, the this, this thing in the field, which is filled along with its companion, the crow, with all sorts of resonance and images, but then you go down here to, you know, like these, these images we create, like, you know, the mummy, uh, the mummy is a real thing, but then it gets used in horror films, but it has a, a, a connection through the, the mask. And even if you go back one up to Christ, Christ is wearing a mask of blood. That's really interesting. Okay. So that's the symbolic realm. And uh, that's the kind of thing that a lot of people have been talking about lately, the connections uh, between uh, things, how, how shapes and graphic images and all of these things have a meaning. All in favor of that. However, for me, that's still way above ground. And, and I'm not going towards the hermetic, the esoteric, uh, magical interpretations. I'm going towards something else, something that was pointed to me by people like the great Russian film director Andrei Tarkovsky, and also uh, by people, writers like Owen Barfield. That is that the things of Earth that we're actually looking at actually contain a, a resonance all of their own that has nothing to do with what they relate to, that is to say, if I look at the earth, yes, I can see, you know, uh, that the earth is a place we plant things. The, the, you know, as a result, uh, you get this idea of fertility. As a result of that, you then get fertility religions. There's all of that, granted. But to me, that still doesn't get what happens if I'm sitting here, like today is just a semi overcast day in Tbilisi. I'm looking out the window and I'm looking at the different, uh, kind of tin roofs, and some of them have gates and doors on top of them. Some of them look like barns on top. There are plants that are just starting to turn green again because it's it's March 2nd. Uh, I see bees buzzing around. See, now, in none of that is any specific symbolic nature. However, it is all full of meaning, and the meaning is all symbolic. Um, Rookmacher talks about how in the Middle Ages, when people looked at the world, they didn't see, for instance, a symbolic meaning and a literal meaning, uh, which is very important if you're a biblical scholar. If you're, if you're reading what we consider today to be a literal meaning into, say, the writings of Moses, you're barking up the wrong tree because Moses didn't write 
the way we write. He wrote so that history and meaning were together. There, it's impossible to pull them apart. We want to say that literally didn't happen or that literally happened. But that's our problem. Owen Barfield calls that our idolatry. We're the ones through our educational process who have seen only H2O and not the effect of H2O upon us, of water upon us, so that we have cut ourselves off. So I don't trust our view of the past because we, so for instance, when people say, yeah, well, miracles didn't happen. Well, how would you know? You live in a world where, you know, uh, a McDonald's cup exists, which is a, an absolutely meaningless object. You take that as normal and given Whereas in the past, such a, a meaningless object would not have existed. We created meaninglessness. So to say that the rules that we understand now are eternal just isn't, I think it's barking up the wrong tree. I'm not saying that uh, the, you know, uh, that uh, Moses was writing history textbooks. Oh, no, not that history textbooks are all that great either, by the way. Um, but. So when I look at things, I see resonances in them. Let me talk a bit about Tarkovsky here for a minute, because this is really important to me. So now what's interesting about Tarkovsky, and I'm going to just go through. No, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stop this now, and we're going to come back and talk about Tarkovsky and symbolic meaning next time, which is really ironic because Tarkovsky was often asked about the symbolic meaning of his films. Um, uh, like when his film Mirror came out, he was approached over and over again by people in Russia and in other places like, what does that all mean? And he says this, I had the greatest difficulty in explaining to people that there is no hidden coded meaning in the film. Nothing beyond the desire to tell the truth. Often, my assurances provoked incredulity, even disappointment. Some people evidently wanted more. They needed arcane symbols, secret meanings. They were not accustomed to the poetics of the cinema image. And I was disappointed in my turn. Such was the reaction of the opposition party in the audience. As for my own colleagues, they launched a bitter attack on me, accusing me of immodesty, of wanting to make a film about myself. Yes. So Tarkovsky seems to have want nothing to do with symbolism. And I would say he wants nothing to do with allegory. He wants nothing to do with the kind of symbolism that would m make each thing in his film equal to something else. That kind of, like I said... On layers of symbolism, Tarkovsky is way down near the bottom. And that is to say, he is looking at the thing itself and asking, what is the meaning of this thing? I will simply point this out before we stop this today. And then uh, we'll come back in a few days and we'll go through Tarkovsky's own ideas here. And I'll give you my comments on them. Is that there are images of dogs in Tarkovsky's work. Now, what he is not showing you is the dog as guardian, the dog as ferocious animal, the dog as pet. He is showing you his dog. And that's important. Because one of the things that gets left out of so many people's discussion of the symbolic, and this is the thing that I saw even before I read his book, when I saw Tarkovsky's dogs, I thought about my own dogs. And yeah, it was highly personal and symbolic of what dogs are to me. But it's also part of the truth of what dogs are. Dogs are not just canis familiaris. Dogs are someone that accompany us. And there is nothing more mysterious in the world than the fact that you have an animal who gets something from you, who is a mysterious companion to you. And that's what Tarkovsky is showing you. But you see, 
that's also a highly symbolic relationship. And what Tarkovsky is not doing is saying this equals that. He is saying this is. And by saying that this is, he is saying it's loaded with meaning. And that meaning is, of course, symbolic. And I think if I were to talk with Tarkovsky, unfortunately, he died about 1987. If I were to talk to Tarkovsky, I think we would eventually agree that that is symbolic meaning. What he was worried about was people who were saying to him, you're putting in these special meanings for us. Of course, these were Russians and other Eastern Europeans who are used to allegory and seeing things. And in fact, my Czech friends in the puppetry world said after a while, people would come to plays and see symbolism of certain sort that wasn't there even in plays like, for instance, they'd see Romeo and Juliet and start to interpret it uh, as being, you know, who, you know, which family equals the West, which equals the East kind of thing. And what Tarkovsky is saying is, no, there's no hidden message here. The thing is, and in fact, what he's also saying is he called it the image. This image that I'm presenting to you is. This is what I see in the world. And it, the artistic image is like the image in nature. It's just there. Once it's there, it's there. And now we look at it, but we're receiving something from it. It's not vitalism. Vitalism is the, the belief uh, that everything has a sentience of sorts, that everything is alive of sorts. It's not that. It's rather that more like uh, the psalmist says, and the trees of the field clap their hands. Now, the psalmist doesn't believe the trees in the field are out there clapping their hands. He means that, though, that when you look at them, and especially on a windy day full of leaves, they are clapping their hands to God. It's that they're filled with meaning, though they are, they are not God themselves, but they are filled with God's meaning. And that meaning is filled with symbolism. So we're going to continue the, that uh, when we talk about Tarkovsky. The last thing I want to mention is that we all have our own personal symbols. And one thing I've been doing for years is kind of writing down when a symbol means something to me. So that the car, the car to me as a symbol, the automobile, isn't simply a vehicle driving down the road. It has to do with moments in my life where that thing became very powerful. So it's the car turned upside down on the side of the road. It is the car as you drive it, you know, on a certain, certain kinds of driving conditions. Um, it's, it could be an old rusty car parked in the middle of the forest in Alaska. Uh, my car is not your car. And it, however, they're both cars, but we'll talk about that more later. And I'll tell you about how I've been kind of constructing a sort of personal symbol dictionary over the years. And it has to do with uh, the fact that I could never find out any symbolism about cars or trains or, or uh, you know, the, all these different things that are in the modern world. And yet they, they are all filled, you know. So the styrofoam cup, in my mind, is shaped by the fact that it will disintegrate in your hands when you pour gasoline in it. You know, that's my symbolism for a styrofoam cup. What is yours? Yours could be very different. Yours could have, you might not have any symbolism at all attached to it. And I think that's more how symbolism works. It's a crude meaning. Now, how does that meaning rub off on things? So that's a very interesting question. It's why do we value antiques more than so much of the new real crap that we make? Part of it is people don't make things with, with the same quality they used to make things. They make things mass produced and cheaply. So that a table now is often made out of junk material. You know, you have to pay a lot of money to get a decent table made. Um, or it's made with a bad design that no one's going to value in the future. Because, again, for commercial reasons. Anyway, we'll leave it there. We'll come back and talk about Tarkovsky and symbolism in part two of this discussion. And thanks for listening. I hope something I've said... Uh, add something to the discussion of symbolism. If you have any thoughts about what I've said or about the subject of symbolism, feel free to write it down. Share this if you feel so inclined. Um, and do feel free to subscribe. I need more subscribers on this channel. And to uh, like it if you like it. And to 
uh, support it through PayPal. And if you do, if you uh, support it, you will get uh, extra material. I'll send it to you through the email. And uh, there's a video here that uh, explains more about that. So anyway, I will see you soon. This is Byrne, uh, your friendly anadromist in uh, Tbilisi, Georgia, waiting for uh, some sort of pandemic. I'll see you soon. Don't worry about it. A people without history is not redeemed from dying. For history is a pattern of timeless moments.